Numbers chapter 13 this morning. Lord willing, over the next couple weeks, we're going to be considering one of my personal favorite Bible characters, especially in the Old Testament, a fellow by the name of Joshua. Joshua got a whole book of the Bible named after him. He was the successor to Moses, the guy who took over after Moses died, the one who actually led the children of Israel into the promised land and led them as they conquered and possessed the promised land. And he's a fellow that you don't read a whole lot of his backstory because most of the focus is on Moses as Joshua is being trained and prepared. And it's not until he's in his 80s uh, in Joshua chapter number 1 that we really uh, see him become the, the central character in the story of, of Israel. But there are uh, a number of mentions of him in the books of Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. And uh, we're going to be looking at perhaps one of the most pivotal events in Joshua's life. And it's the time when he and 11 other men were sent out as spies into the land of Canaan. Now, this is not the first time we meet Joshua. We meet him first back in Exodus chapter 17, I believe it is, when the Israelites are commanded by God to fight against the Amalekites. And that's the famous story, if you remember, where Moses is up on the hillside and the Israelites are down in the valley fighting. And whenever Moses would hold his rod up like this over his head, the Israelites would prevail. But when his arms got tired and he would lower them, then the Amalekites would prevail. And finally, Aaron and Hur came alongside Moses and they held his hands up and they put a rock under him so he could have a seat. And they held his hands up all day long so that the Israelites might have the victory. But Joshua was the one who was down in the valley actually leading the fight. And I got to thinking about that. That's the first time we meet Joshua. Of, of how frightening that must have been from Joshua's point of view. Now, I'm going to assume that he could see Moses up on the hill... And that they're probably at some point, he, he figured it out that when Moses had his hands up, they were winning. And when Moses' hands fell down, they were losing. How frightening it must have been for Joshua to be down in the valley, actually in the fight, just wondering how long can that old guy keep his hands in the air? And then when perhaps he saw out of the corner of his eye, Aaron and her come beside Moses and hold his hands up, he's probably thinking, whew, I'm glad somebody stepped in to help. And that day they had a great victory, and it was actually under Joshua's leadership. And so the very first time we meet him, Joshua's already in the thick of things. He becomes one of the main characters as uh, he is eventually chosen to be the guy to follow up Moses' leadership. And later in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, we see that he's actually a, a appointed that leader and anointed by God. And uh, the spirit of Moses is given to him and, and the people are to follow Joshua's leadership. But in between that, we come across this story that's recorded in Numbers chapters 13 and 14. We're not going to read the entire thing uh, for sake of time, but we're going to read portions of it as we, as we look at this story of the 12 spies that were sent into Canaan. You may remember, and if you don't remember, spoiler alert, this is how it goes, uh, that they sent 12 spies into the land of Canaan. And this was by God's direction. Look at Numbers 13 and verse number 1. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. And so this was at the Lord's direction that they were sending out 12 men to spy out the land. 12 men who were seen as leaders amongst each of the tribe. And Joshua was chosen for his tribe as one of those, uh, those 12 men. Now, I say this from the beginning to point out the fact that, that this was indeed God's idea that they send out 12 spies. But as we're going to find out in just a minute... Those spies, ten of them at least, misunderstood why God was sending them. God said in verse number 2, Send them to the land that I give you. Present tense. This is your land. Send them out there. But 
when the spies came back, ten of them said, you know, it's a great land, but there's no way we can take it. The people are too strong. These ten spies discouraged the people of God. But there were two men who stood against the crowd. Two men who were willing to be in the minority. Two men who, in spite of the obstacles and challenges, were willing to trust God, that God would keep His promises. Those two men were Caleb and Joshua. As we've been thinking about pressing on this year, and looking at the stories in the Bible of these characters who did amazing things, we've been thinking about how often they had to persevere in spite of hardship. And they had to just continually make right choices, even in difficult situations, before they ever got to the mountain peak experiences. Because so often we focus on just the highlights and not the whole story. And I believe this is one of the places that was, it was a pivotal time in Joshua's life. It would have been easy for him to simply go with the crowd. To say, well, you know, the majority rules, that's what everybody wants to do, so I guess that's what we're going to do. It would have been easy for him to do that, but instead, Joshua stood against the crowd. And if you're going to be faithful to God, there are going to be many times where you are going to have to stand against the crowd. Where you're going to have to be in the minority. In fact, as a believer, as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ... You are in the minority. You are a part of the little flock that follows the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to understand that and you need to be okay with that. And we should ask ourselves the question then, how can I stand against the overwhelming majority that wants to go the opposite direction from where God wants me to go. I don't know if you realize this yet or not, but American culture is no longer headed in the right direction. And if you are going to be true to God in 2021 in America, you're going to have to go against the grain. You're going to have to go against the flow. You're going to have to stand against the crowd. And what we're going to see from Joshua's story is that he was able to stand against the crowd because he chose to stand with God. When you choose to stand with God, it does not matter who stands against you. They cannot defeat you. When you stand with God, you are guaranteed victory. For Joshua and Caleb, it was all a matter of perspective. Some people chose to focus on the obstacles and the human perspective. But Joshua and Caleb chose to focus on God. They said, yes, those giants over there are big, but our God is bigger. Yes, they have walled cities, but our God is able to defeat them. Because God made us a promise. He said, this is the land, I will give it to you. And we choose to stand with God, who always keeps His promises. That was their perspective. Their perspective affected their perception of the situation. It affected the direction they went, and it affected the completion or the destination that they arrived at. If you want to have God's best for your life, then you have to have a right perspective on God and be willing to stand with God against the crowd. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we study this story that to many of us is familiar, I pray that you would help us to have an open heart and an open mind to what you have to say to us today through it. Lord, there are challenges that every individual in here is facing. And there's something in this passage of Scripture I believe that they can use and apply today to something they're going through in their life. I pray that you would give that to them. And through the Holy Spirit, that you'd minister to hearts through your word. Ultimately, Lord, that you would glorify yourself through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
We're going to skip some of the in-between verses in this chapter and go down to verse number 21. The spies have been sent out, one from every tribe. All twelve of them go out and they spend 40 days spying out the land. They come back and we notice, first of all, the report of the majority given in verse 21 and following. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, and as men come to Hamath, and they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Ahiman and Shishiah and Telmai, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came unto the brook of Eshcol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called the brook Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after forty days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel under the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit their fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great, and moreover we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. I call this group the Conquering Canaan Committee. These twelve men went out, spent forty days searching through the land and observing all that they could, and they came back bringing some evidence of the, the bountiful fruit of the land, and 100% of them agreed that the land was just like God said. They started out in agreement by saying, yes, this is a great land. It flows with milk and honey. In Exodus 3 and verse number 8, the Lord said, I'm come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And they came back and they said, yes, it is that kind of a place, a land that flows with milk and honey, describing the abundance of them, of, of, of the, uh, the crops that they produced and how good it was to live in and, the, and how well the, the livestock would have thrived. But ten of them, ten of the twelve, that is 83 and a third percent, if you want a mathematical percentage for it, ten of the twelve said, yes, it's a great land, but we can't conquer it. We can't do it because there's some big people that live there, and, and they're mean looking, and they've got some really, really big walls around their city. They said because the people were bigger than they were, then therefore they must be stronger than we are, and therefore we cannot conquer the land. I think verse 33 really identifies what their problem was. It was a problem of perspective. They said, we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in, notice their phrasing here, we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. They said, we looked at them, and we looked at us, and we said, we are not big enough to conquer them. We're like grasshoppers compared to them. It was all about perspective. And then, 
Not only did they say, well, we saw ourselves as grasshoppers, they then jumped to the conclusion, they made an assumption, so they must see us as grasshoppers too. You know, the truth of the matter is that the inhabitants of Canaan were afraid of the Israelites. In Joshua chapter 2, Joshua is getting ready to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. And we have a sort of a reenactment of this scene. He sends out two spies, not 12 this time. He, he learned his lesson. You let those committees get too big and nothing good ever happens from them. He sends out two spies to go into Jericho to spy it out. And when those two spies come into Jericho, they meet a lady by the name of Rahab. And Rahab tells these two spies that from the time that they heard how God split the Red Sea and delivered Israel out of Egypt until that day, which was 40 years, they had been afraid of the Israelites. That was what she said. The truth was that the inhabitants of the land of Canaan were afraid of the Israelites because they had seen and they had heard what God had done for them. But because these ten saw things from the human perspective only, instead of looking with the eye of faith, they looked with the eye of flesh, and they evaluated the situation from a human perspective, they said, no, it can't be done. Notice the report of the minority here. It begins in verse number 30 when it says, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Notice Caleb did not contradict the challenges that they said that there was in the land. He acknowledged that. Yeah, they're big. Yeah, they've got great cities. Yeah, they're, they're, they're mean-looking people. I'm sure they can fight well, but we are able to overcome it. That was his assessment. And then go down to chapter 14, and look at verse number 7. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. This is Joshua and Caleb. Verse 8, If the people, or excuse me, if the Lord delight in us, then He will bring us into this land, and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Here was Caleb and Joshua's perspective. Yes, they're big, but God is bigger. We are able to overcome it because the Lord is with us. If the Lord delight in us, then He will bring us into the land. They were saying, listen, folks, you've got it all wrong. You're focusing on the wrong thing. You're focusing on how big they are instead of focusing on the promise that God has made. And He promised that He would deliver this land into our possession. Now, this was just two of the twelve, 16 and two-thirds percent of the Conquering Canyon Committee. So if they were going to put it to a vote just amongst the committee, it would have never even made it out of committee, as we say in modern legislation language. Ten of the twelve said, no, we can't do it. Only two, Caleb and Joshua, stood up and said, yes, we can. Now, we know this story, many of us from Sunday school days, and we just kind of accept the fact, well, of course they did. That's, that's how the story goes. But put yourself in Joshua and Caleb's position. How much pressure would you have felt to just go with the flow, to just side with the majority. After all, this, you know, we live in a democratic republic, a, re, a constitutional republic. We elect our representatives and, and, and there's a sense of majority rule to an extent in our, in our government. And so we, we kind of accept the fact that you know, the, the direction of the nation is going to be determined by the majority to a great extent. But these guys said, no, that's not right. We don't care if the majority thinks that we should go the other direction. God said this is our land and we believe that's the direction that we should go. They chose to side with God. And because of that, they were in the minority. Listen, do not be surprised if you're in the minority when you side with God. 
It should, it should come as no surprise to us when these polls coming out, come out saying that a majority of Americans support things that God says are sinful. It should not come as a surprise to us when a, a majority of our fellow citizens elect leaders who openly say, we want to take this nation in a direction that's not the direction God wants us to go in. They openly say that they want to take it in a direction, and that direction is not the direction God wants us to go in. We should not be surprised. Jesus Himself said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. A great contrast there between the many and the few. The majority looked at the Canaanites and at themselves and they said, we can't do it. The minority looked at the Lord and said, God can do it. And so we see next the rebellion of the masses. Numbers chapter 14, verse number 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt." Congregation as a whole followed the majority report of the Conquering Canaan Committee. And they said, this is, this is crazy. What are we doing? We're going to die here in the wilderness. They turned on Moses and Aaron. They said, why did you bring us out here? Did you bring us out here to kill us? It'd be better for us if we'd have died in Egypt or if we had already died in, in the wilderness because now our children are going to be a prey and we're going to die and it's all, it's going to be terrible. And, and then they came up with this brilliant plan. Let's go back to Egypt. Let's elect a new leader to replace you, Moses. And, and let's go back to that place where we were slaves, where we had to make bricks all day long for Pharaoh and help him build his monuments where they beat us, where we had no liberty. Why? Well, because it, they didn't say it here, but in other places they said they had onions and garlics and leeks and stuff. At least the food was good, was their attitude. And the people rebelled against God because of the influence of those ten men. There are a lot of people who do not have the courage to stand in the minority to do right. A lot of people that are just going to allow themselves to be carried along by whatever the trend is at the moment. There's a verse in Scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that talks about people being carried about with every wind of doctrine. And there are people, there are Christians today who that is true of them. They are spiritually immature, and so they are not firmly rooted in Christ. He is not truly their anchor, holding them steady. They are allowing themselves to be blown about by every wind of doctrine. And their Christian life is determined by whatever is trending on social media. And again, this may be news to you, but whatever is trending on social media is not necessarily right. And if that is what you are depending on for your walk with God and your spirituality, whatever's popular at the moment, you are never going to be a mature and a stable Christian. You have to be willing to stand with God, to stand on the truth regardless of what everyone else around you is doing. This congregation as a whole, they, they were not willing to simply trust God. They rebelled. Now, lest we be too hard on them, we see this happen all the time around us and sometimes in our own lives. Some people say, well, how can that many people be wrong about something? You know, if it weren't true, I mean, we're, we're going with 82 and a third percent of the conquering Canaan, Canaan committee here. Surely that, that large of a majority can't be, can't be wrong. 
Yeah, they can. They can because they're human. We see again polls and studies and all of these things that come out all the time about different moral issues. And a certain majority of people believe that this is the right way. Truth is not determined by taking a poll. And we do not vote on what is morally right and what is wrong. God is the one who decides that. And so it doesn't matter if 99.9% .9 of Americans think something is right. If God says it's wrong, it's wrong. Period. These people had a wrong perspective. Because of that, they believed a lie. They believed the lie that they could not conquer Canaan. And so notice what happened down in verse 22 of this chapter. The Lord said, Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. The result of this incident was that that entire generation had to spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness until every one of them that was aged 20 and older at the point that this story occurred died in the wilderness with the exception of Joshua and Caleb. Everyone else died because they refused to side with God. They said, I'm going to stand with the majority. Joshua and Caleb were the only two who chose to stand against the crowd. And because of that, they were the only two who entered into the promised land. And how could they do that? Because they had a right perspective. I want you to think with me about how important perspective is. First of all, perspective affects your perception. Now, perspective is the point of view from which you see something. Perception describes how you see it or how it looks to you would be a better way to put it. Let me give you an illustration. Uh, have you ever used binoculars before? Okay, it's important you look through the correct end. If you flip them around backwards and you look through the big end, then everything you see is going to look really tiny, really far away. But if you flip them around and you use them properly, then everything is going to look closer up and larger. Okay? It's a difference of perspective, how you're looking at it, that determines your perception, how it looks to you. Again, as it applies in this story, you had two completely different or perspectives. One perspective was from the human perspective. I'm going to stand here at the human side. I'm going to look at it from the human perspective. And all I see are really big, ugly guys with walled cities and, you know, swords and spears. And uh, they're just so much bigger than we are. There's no way we could do it. That was one perspective. The other perspective was looking at it from the godly side. Through the lens of God's promises, if you will. Through the through the eye of faith that said, yes, there's big people and walled cities, but God is able. Because they had different perspectives, they had a different perception. One saw a problem too big to solve. The other saw a God too big to fail. Perspective affects perception. It's vital that we then make God our focus. When you focus on God, everything else will be in its proper place. When you keep your focus on God, your perspective on everything else will be right. Material things are kept in their proper perspective. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12 says... Keep your eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Set your affections on things above and not on things on earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Colossians chapter 3. So many times we make the mistake of getting our eyes off of God and we begin to look around us and we get, begin to look inside ourselves. And whenever that is our focus, whenever our focus is external or internal, it's a wrong focus. It's a wrong perspective and it inevitably leads to a wrong perception. Our focus cannot be external or internal, it must be eternal. We have to keep our eyes on God. We don't compare ourself or our situation to what we see around us and then make decisions based on that. That's what the majority of the conquering Canaan committee did. They compared themselves to the giants and they said, nope, doesn't work, we can't do it. And they led an entire nation of people into rebellion. And it is always easier to follow the path of wickedness because it is the path of least resistance. It's what your flesh naturally wants to do. And so it's always going to be easier for you to just give in to the flesh and just, just go with the majority that wants to go in that direction. It's difficult to stand against the crowd and to say, no, I'm going to do what's right and I'm going to stand with God. Perspective affects perception. But know this also, that perspective affects direction. One of the most important things to know when you're driving is keep your eyes on the road. I've never done this, but I've heard stories of people who were looking around them while they were driving and they were swerving a little bit. I've never done that, but I've heard stories. It's important to keep your eyes on the road ahead of you so that you can stay in your lane and you can keep going in the right direction. Your perspective determines your direction. Spiritually, whatever you are focused on in life is the direction your life is going. It's where you're headed. I think it's very interesting that at this juncture, the people had a choice. Go forward into Canaan or go back to Egypt. And because they had a wrong perspective, which direction did they choose? back. Let's go back to Egypt. If they'd had a right perspective, if they had seen through the eye of faith, they'd have looked at it through the lens of God's promises. They would have said, yes, we can do this because God is with us. You've all heard the admonition, watch where you're going. Watch your step. Because if you're not looking, you might trip. The Israelites had an epic trip up, if you will, because they were not focused in the right direction. Even as Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. If you're not focused on God, you're not headed in the right direction, plain and simple. If you're not focused on God, you're not headed in the right direction. Young people, let me say to you, as you're evaluating choices for your life. And we've got some young people in here who are making the very bad decision of growing up. And uh, no, I know you can't help it. And you're going to be facing increasingly more difficult decisions about your life. You're wondering where should I go? What should I do? And all of these different things. And can I give you one piece of advice? Keep your focus on God in everything. In every decision, think, what does God want me to do here? Is this pleasing to the Lord? What is God's will in this matter? And I firmly believe, because I've seen it in God's Word and I've experienced in my life, that if you want to follow God, God will give you clear directions. All right? He's not going to toy with you and, and say, oh, well, why don't you go over here? Oh, just kidding. No, that doesn't, that's not what God does. 
He will show you. But keep your focus on God. Because perspective affects direction. Paul would write of a man by the name of Demas and say of him, He hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And there are a lot of Christians who are so in love with this world. They're like those Israelites and what, how they thought of Egypt. Conveniently, they forgot all the pain and the hardship and the bondage. Conveniently, all they could remember at this time was just how wonderful it was. To have